and uh, it's called Clothed in Readiness. And if you're listening online, the domain is, or the URL to get his book is clothedinreadiness.com. Clothedinreadiness.com. And so I want to encourage you, if you're listening online, to get this book. If you're, if you're here in person, we're going to, we got some in the back, we can, or in the foyer here that we'll have available after the service. We really want to encourage you. Ben's going to share uh, what this book is about, why he wrote this book, and really the main message. But when I, I've read about four chapters, and uh, it's a really, really great book. I, the thing I love about this book is it, it's taking the message of the need to be made ready, which is a weighty, serious message, but it's, it, it's, it's a very easy read. It's, it's very easy. It's like you're sitting over dinner with him or drinking coffee with him. It's just a very conversational style of writing, and I love that about this book. And so I want to encourage you to get a copy of his book, share it with some friends, and uh, it's a very important word. The Lord's really raised him up to release that very important word, the, the need to be made ready. And so uh, I want to encourage you to get that. So Ben, go ahead, come on up here, my friend. And um, Ben, he's got Ben hates Georgia more than my dad. So that's the introduction there. That uh, I think Ken hates Georgia. I don't too. know, I man. It's no, nice. it's it's you. You officially hate Georgia more than my dad. So, uh, but but seriously though, uh, you definitely uh, start by sharing you know why you wrote this book sure. and what's the who are you writing to and kind of the burden the lord gave you and then after sure. that just jump right in so yeah sounds good let's uh let's go before the lord before i get started lord we can do this the hard way or the easy way um the hard way is i could get up here and spout off all my good ideas and everything that I think you want to say and just totally interject myself and that would benefit no one, Lord, or we can do this the easy way. And I choose that, Lord, that you would arise and testify of yourself as only you can. Lord, I yield to you in the truest sense. And I ask, Lord, that I, I was just even in worship thinking about this, Lord, and that this is not false humility. This is not uh, just a religious sentiment that I feel like I need to say to project an image of humility. It is the truth. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, Lord, to untie your sandals. I can say that with John. I'm not worthy to stand in this place of, and testify of you, Lord. I'm not worthy to be a recipient of your life as you've given yourself to me. And I'm so grateful that you love me enough. I'm so grateful that you love each one of us enough, not only to speak to us this morning. A message is, Lord, I know it's necessary, and I don't want to diminish that in any way, but that's the least of your concerns. That's the least of your priorities on your agenda. You would go far beyond a message and you would give yourself to us in life and that to eternal increase, Lord, for the rest of the ages to come, that we would live in a constant increase of your life in us. What a beautiful thought that you would take a people who corporately were not worthy to bow down and untie your sandals, Lord, and fill us with the full measure of the beloved son. Thank you, Lord. Would you give us ears to hear this morning what you have to say to us? And would you get me out of your way, Lord, and testify of your son through me? I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I had someone, hey, Chris, my childhood friend, my best friend growing up, Chris Ray. I'm sorry to divert. You guys don't know him. He doesn't know y'all, but He's back here. He lives in Atlanta, and I've now thoroughly embarrassed him, and I haven't seen him in years, but I'm so grateful you're here. Um, I, I do want to say from the get-go, somebody asked me about this. I, I am wearing my, my belt. I'll show it to you. I'm wearing my belt. This was a kind of a source of friction, I think, several years back when I visited, and I didn't have a belt, and I had to borrow a belt from Brian. So if the message is not as anointed as it was then... <laughs> You know, that, that was, I, but there was an anointing for like a two and a half hour message then. And I'm just going to be, 
Yeah, everybody's glad. I, I'm just, I want to show John this. John, this, these are my notes. I have one page front and back of scribbled notes. Normally I have like typed out like five or six pages. So that's a good sign, right? I, can, you, can you bear with me? It's kind of scary for me a little bit today because normally I do depend on my notes and, and I had a message and the Lord yesterday was like, you just toss that one in the trash can because that's not what I want you to, to share. And so um, for me, the Lord's getting me off of dependency on, on my notes and all this, which is good because we're talking about the life of Christ coming forth within us. If, if we can't learn to follow him where he leads, if we have to be scripted, trusting in our own understanding, then we're not leaning upon that life. And that's partly what I want to share. But I do want to share, you know, a little bit about the book. Actually, I was thinking about this. This book, I think, is underrated. I, I, can I just say that in humility? I think this is a very underrated book, and, and there's a reason why I'm saying that. It is listed on Amazon. Um, so if you're online and you want to get the book, it is on Amazon. That's a shameless little plug there. But I say it's underrated because if you search for this book, Clothed in Readiness, on Amazon, the very first thing that pops up is diapers. Is that right? It's a book and then a whole, whole page of cloth diapers. So if I can't beat out cloth diapers, I would say it's a little bit underrated. But uh, Brian was actually instrumental, I think, in in uh, bringing this book to fruition. Brian prophesied over me twice that the Lord had a book that he wanted to write through me. And, you know, it's kind of like with a lot of what Brian says to me, uh, I just dismissed it at first. And <laughs> I'm kidding. I I'm kidding. Um, I can say that just Brian knows my sense of humor. I, I don't mean any disrespect to Brian, but um, I, I did. I was like, well, Lord, you know, if there's a book you want to write, I mean, I'm open to it. And then the second time, you know, which was a couple years later, he said it again, and I was like, okay, um, should I be doing something, Lord, to make this happen? So I, I actually sat down at a computer to write a book and nothing. I mean, I sat there for like two hours, and I had, I even started typing, and I'm like, this is garbage. Like, I just was like, this is not going to happen. And then I think it was one more time when, when uh, you prophesied it, uh, I think two years ago in... No, 2021, you said, the, you told me again, the Lord's got a book he wants to write uh, through you. And I was here staying with Brian and Angie. And, um, and sure enough, the Lord spoke to me that, I think that afternoon, I was driving through Atlanta and I heard the Lord clear as day. And he said, the message of readiness is lost in my house. And he said, it's time to bring it back. And I knew instantly that there was a book I was supposed to write. And my internal dialogue with the Lord, I'm going, I should be reading a book on readiness because I'm not even sure. I, I'm serious. I'm not even sure I understand fully what we're getting ready for, let alone the process of getting ready. You know, sometimes language, I think, can be a little bit of a barrier for us because we, we tend to, especially in the church, we say things in a certain language and we just assume that everybody knows the meaning and the implications of the words we're choosing to use. And sometimes maybe through peer pressure or something, we can act like we know what people are saying without really having a good understanding of what's being communicated. And so what is it that we're getting ready for? And I think you guys probably, it's been hit on in this church because I know, you know your leadership and I know the kind of messages that that you've been getting on a regular basis, but for much of the church, we're completely lost as to what we're getting ready for. I mean, we're, are we getting ready for heaven? Is that it? You know, are we getting ready for some kind of kingdom on the earth that's all external? And is heaven in, in our future? I mean, I'm not denying that, and I'm not denying that the Lord is going to establish his kingdom on the earth, but ultimately what we're getting ready for transcends all of that. Ultimately, what we're getting ready for is relationship, right? And you guys know this. I mean, Brian wrote an excellent book um, about the eternal, what is it, the eternal blueprint? Yeah, that it's God's eternal purpose for humanity. And that is expressed in three different sort of paradigms. It's expressed in the relationship of the mature son with the father. It's expressed in the bride 
for the Son, and it's expressed in the temple of the Holy Spirit. But ultimately, none of those. And by the way, I hope you understand how blessed you are to be in a church that not only understands this, but is proclaiming this. Because for much of the church, we really are lost and we think it's just about getting saved. And, and Brian and I were talking yesterday, and, and when I say this, please don't take this as criticism. I know that when Brian talks about this, this is not criticism. We're not on a witch hunt to find the false teachers in the church. Well, I want to talk about false teaching today. That's part of the message. The church in our day, especially in the West, is littered with false teachers. Some who have evil intent, I'm convinced. Most probably who don't have evil intent. It's just they're relying on the wrong source. And they're not living by the life of Christ within. They haven't submitted to a maturing process so that that life can come forth. But, um, but most of the church, we, we're completely bored with Christianity and Christianity as we've come to know it. Because the essence of Christianity in our day is you're saved, you're going to heaven, so better put things in maintenance mode so you don't lose your salvation and try to do a few good works and just maintain what you've got and wait it out to the end so you can make it to this place called heaven. And so it's no wonder we become distracted with all of these add-ons, right? And, and we were talking about this with, uh, you know, we, we tend to get our focus, depending on what stream of Christianity we're in, we tend to get our, our focus off of the Lord and onto other things. And they're not always bad things. You know, some of us maybe have come from a background where we're really focused on blessings, you know, the blessings of the Lord. And that can at times take place in the form of healing or uh, prosperity. And I'm not a prosperity teacher, but there are times where the Lord just really has met our financial needs and more. And we're so grateful for that. And that is a very real aspect of being in relationship with the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He provides for us. But if we get really bored and we take our eyes off of Jesus and we begin to fixate on these external things, we got a problem. We're no longer focusing on what this is all about because this is a relationship. And if you're not taught that there is a full expression of this relationship whereby he is meant to inhabit us in greater and greater measure, subjugating conquering our own souls so that his life becomes the dominant life in us. You know, he must increase, we must decrease. And so as we get fixated on other things, we completely miss out on the heart of what this is all about. And it doesn't matter what our focus is on, whether it's blessings or whether it's you know, we get fixated on external things like signs and wonders, or if we get fixated on spiritual gifts or whatever it may be, we get fixated on our doctrines or we get fixated on our ministries. If we take our eyes off of Jesus, we have a problem because he is ultimately what this is all about. You know, I heard a terrible message years ago by, by a big name person. And again, my, my heart is not to just you know, well, I'm not on a witch hunt. I'm not into naming names. I wouldn't do that, but unless the Lord directed me, I think it's probably going to come to a time here pretty soon where the true prophetic is going to have to confront some of the silliness head on. But we better know we're being led by the Lord. But I did hear a message years ago, and it was by a well-known person within a particular stream of Christianity talking about how Jesus was simply the door to the kingdom and how it's, what a shame that we're fixated on the door. You, you don't go into a place you know, just pre you're preoccupied with the door. And I thought, if that's what we think of Jesus, God help us. He's not only the door and the way into the kingdom, he is the entirety of the kingdom. He came proclaiming a kingdom that is within. Within who? Within him. It doesn't exist outside of the Son. God is reconciling all things to himself. Where? In the Son and we need to get back to this reality. So you guys are, are blessed, and I know that what you're getting largely is, is that message. 
But I really, I, I kind of, as, as the Lord had me go through this process, I'm like, Lord, I've got to be clear. What is it that we are being prepared for? What does that look like? And the Lord immediately took back. And I've, I've got this, you know, I, I've, I've sat under the teaching. We're blessed to be a part of, of Terry and, and uh, Josiah Bennett's um, fellowship up in Tennessee. And, and we've been in relationship with them for years. I know you guys are very familiar with Terry I'm so grateful that the Lord used Terry to bring forth this revelation in my life, and it has changed everything. To me, it's the glue that holds the, the scriptures together, right, Diane? I mean, there's so much that you're like, I, I don't see the connection between this and this passage and this and this passage, but all of a sudden, when you have God's eternal purpose in mind, the very purpose for which we were created, it's like it all makes sense. And the journey along the way, it's unto something very specific. And it, and it actually empowers you to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in the way that's necessary for Him to prepare you. But I've got a measure of revelation, and I still, I'm like, Lord, I need to be clear because I'm, gonna, I'm about to put this into words, right? So I need to make sure that it's solidified. And the Lord took me to Matthew 21, and I want to read this, this passage together. This is a very familiar, um, sorry, I just, you ever have those moments where like you're just totally not thinking and you reach for something that's clearly in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew and you start flipping around in the Old, does anybody else do that? Any, okay, good. I would say it's because I'm 50 now and maybe my mind isn't what it used to be, but I think I did that when I was younger. Uh, but this is a very familiar passage of Scripture and probably if there's a, a heading in your Bible, um, it's probably something along the lines of the parable of the wicked tenants or the parable of the vineyard or something like that. I don't know. But it, it, normally the, the focus is on the tenants itself. But I want to read this scripture because this is what the Lord, he just put this scripture in my heart. And, uh, and I read it and I was like, okay, Lord, what does this have to do with eternal purpose? So I'll read it and then I'll tell you what the Lord told me. Verse 33, hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants. And he went into another country. I want to stop right there. Does anybody know where else in scripture we find almost this exact statement? It's in Isaiah 5, 2. In, uh, in, a, in a portion of scripture where the Lord is pronouncing judgment on Israel for their waywardness. They had become quite religious in some ways and quite um, the opposite of anything that we would think of or associate with religious behavior in other ways, right? They had gone full on into idolatry and completely abandoned the Lord. And he was pronouncing judgment that was coming upon Israel uh, back in Isaiah's day. So uh, Isaiah 5 and Matthew 21 kind of go hand in hand. Let's read on verse 34. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Now, we can read this scripture through the lens of history and we can see that there is clearly one level of application for this scripture. And that is... Jesus was showing up onto the scene in Israel in his day and saying basically to the religious leaders of Israel, you guys have completely, 
completely abandoned the entire purpose for which you were established as a nation. And therefore, I am going to do something so wonderful that was intended for you guys, and you guys were meant to be my priestly nation unto the rest of the world. And that was the intent in the original covenant. And I, there was always going to be a new covenant. Don't get me wrong in this. But Israel meant to stand in a place of priesthood. They should have understood God's eternal plan and purpose. It should have been clear to them. Paul says to the Romans, to the Jews in Rome, you, you're without excuse. Because God's attributes, he said it not only to the Jews, also to the Gentiles. He says God's attributes are clearly seen in all of creation. You know, the fact that he was going to give himself to us is clear in the scriptures. And yet Israel had wandered so far away from God's plan and purpose how they had become quite religious. They were depending on their own ability to relate to God and their own ability to do what they reasoned in their own minds and to live as they thought God would have them live. And they became quite self-sufficient. And in their self-sufficiency, they became a rebellious people. And so Jesus was saying, you've missed it. You've missed the boat on this. And I'm about to take this thing to the nations. You know, right? That's the point. I'm looking for a people who will bear the fruit that the Father is after. Almost an identical indictment in Isaiah 5. And I'm not going to turn to Isaiah 5. but So we know that historically the Lord did judge the nation of Israel. Right? If that's all we see in this scripture, then we're missing the point. What I want us to see in this is that, and this to me relates right back to God's eternal plan and purpose. It's clear in the scriptures. The Father has planted a vineyard, and he's after fruit. And at the end of the day, just because, and hear this now, just because we're a part of the church age, Just because we're under the new covenant, just because we're under grace does not mean that we're not going to face the same judgment. Did we produce the fruit that the Father is after? Like that plan doesn't change. It's where most of the church, would you mind bringing my water up, please? I'm I'm sorry, I I forgot to bring it. It's my lovely wife, Heather. I just wanted y'all to see her. But most of the church is in delusion about, the, about judgment. We don't think we're going to be judged. We don't think we're going to have to be held to account for anything. I, I'm, I'm sorry, and I, I don't, again, I'm not trying to castigate an entire movement, but the greasy grace message is, is a cancer in the modern church. I love the grace of the Lord. I'm nothing without the grace of the Lord. We were talking about this last night, but grace, we mistake mercy and grace. Grace is not, oh, God just looks at our sin and winks at it and goes, no worries, I got the blood and it's all under the blood. I'm thankful that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. But what is grace? That word in the Greek is charis, and it literally means that God has extended himself to us to do something that we couldn't do on our own. He's so powerful that he took on our punishment at the cross. He endured the judgment of the Father at the cross for our sin, but the story doesn't end there. He has given himself to us, and now he wants to consecrate us fully unto himself and fill us with his life and empower us to live the kind of life that he anticipated that we would live when he created us in the first place. And we are going to be judged, and we're going to be judged by this standard. Did you produce the fruit that I was after when I conceived of the idea of humanity long before I ever went through the process of creating you? Well, God is after a very specific kind of fruit, right? So what is that fruit? It'd be kind of important to know what that is if we're going to be held to account for it. Most of us think that fruit has to do with a ministry or a work. We, don't we tend to associate works with fruitfulness? And those two concepts have been conflated wrongly in the church. I had someone say to me the other day, oh, I'm going to this wonderful church. It's just full of life and so fruitful. 
And I thought, what, by what standard? I didn't say this because this was somebody I didn't really want to get into an argument with. But I said, by what standard are you know, thinking to myself, by what standard are you measuring fruit? And I promise you that for most of us, well, they have a good children's program. I mean, they do, they, they have an evangelism program. And I mean, they're, they're in the community and they're doing all these external things. But that's not fruit. That's works. And God's not against works. I mean, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in, what was the rest of the scripture? We are his workmanship, created for good works, which he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he's not against works. He's for works. But works have to be a result of his life flowing through the, through us, not just our good intentions and our good ideas, right? But that's not fruit. The fruit that he's after is directly related to what Paul points to in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, gentleness, goodness, kindness, self-control. So, does that mean we should get busy trying to be more loving and more peaceful and more joyful? Again, this is where a lot of confusion comes in. Much of the church has that mentality. In fact, the way I was taught growing up, God has saved you by His grace, so you've hit the reset button. Don't blow it. Make sure you live this Christian life and make sure you learn to walk in love and joy and peace and patience and all those things or else you, you might lose your salvation. And I grew up terrified and with major condemnation as a child thinking that I was always going to lose my salvation. But you guys, we can't manufacture the fruit that the Lord is after. If I try to emulate God's love at best, I'm just going to have a cheap counterfeit that looks like God's love but the essence of it will be anything but the love of Christ flowing through me. I actually had a, a time with the Lord where the Lord was talking to me about his love recently. Um, I, I don't remember if I put it in this book or not, but I was just before the Lord and he was, he was talking to me about the fact, and I, maybe I, this probably didn't happen. Maybe it's possible that Heather had asked me to do something, and I might have had a little bit of an attitude, and I could have expressed that. Probably not, because that no, normally doesn't happen. But as I was kind of meditating on the Lord, he said to me, he said, real love wraps a towel around its waist and gets on its hands and knees and washes the feet of others at the most inconvenient of times. I mean, when I think about the Lord on the night, can you guys imagine if you knew that the cross was before you? I mean, a physical cross. Do you think you would have the wherewithal and the presence of mind in and of yourself to on the night before you were about to endure that, to get on your hands and knees and wash the feet of others? I mean, if ever there was a convenient time and an okay time to go, uh, look, this is not the best time for me to be serving you. I'm going to the cross tomorrow. But the Lord said to me, that's what real love looks like. And then he said this to me, Larry. He said, you know nothing of that kind of love. He nailed me. Now, he wasn't being condemning. It's just the truth of it. As a man or a woman, I'm just saying as humanity, we know nothing of that kind of love until we taste it for ourselves. We sure as heck can't, uh, can we say heck in this church? Sure. Right. We sure as heck can't manufacture it, right? And so our best efforts to try to give something of the life of Christ through our own doing is misrepresenting the full extent of the Father's love to a broken and dying world. Can we not see that we desperately need an other than life to come forth through us if we have any hope of a broken and dying world coming to know Jesus in the way they were meant to? Can we not see that? 
I'm not saying that there, we haven't had a little bit of success in our efforts to evangelize. Of course, I, I say that. We've had no success. You can't come to the Lord unless the Father draws you. So it's all a function of the Lord. I'm just saying I believe the Lord would have much more to work with if we would just stop trying to piddle around with our own human efforts to manufacture the life of Christ and learn to just get in the flow of the Holy Spirit, yield to him, and allow him to come forth in fullness. You guys, that's what we're being prepared for. Again, much of the church wrongly thinks, I've had this conversation with people in my own family. Hey, you know, it's great that you're going down this path, but it's just in our mind it looks like a bunch of legalism because when we die and we behold him face to face we're going to be made like him and so all that you're trying to accomplish now we're going to be made like him as soon as we see him and it's a misunderstanding of that scripture we need to understand we are a product of our choices and I want you to think about this You've made a series of choices over your life to be the person that you are today and to be in the relationship that you have with the Lord today. We wrongly appropriate the grace of God thinking that, and again in the Greasy Grace movement, but I think this is prevalent all over the church regardless of what stream, that it doesn't really matter because we're all going to have the full extent, doesn't matter how you live your life today, because we're all going to have the full extent of what God intended as soon as we cross over into eternity because we'll be made like Him in an instant. But what we're not understanding is we are a product of our choices and who you choose to be today determines what you're going to be in eternity. Leonard Ravenhill, there was a quote that Leonard Ravenhill was famous for saying. That is that this life is simply a dressing room for eternity. You are determining who you're going to be. And specifically you're determining the relationship you're going to have with the Lord in eternity. If we make a series of choices against relationship and intimacy with the Lord and cooperation with his process to conform us to the image of the Son in the here and now, what makes you think when you cross over that all of that is going to be negated? It won't be. You have proven yourself to be a stubborn, unteachable child. On the contrary... If we choose to cooperate with him and we learn obedience in the same way that Jesus learned obedience, Hebrews tells us he learned obedience through the things he suffered, then we are being prepared for an eternal relationship whereby the life of Christ is not only given to us but freely flows through us because we've been accustomed to submitting to the hand of God and choosing him. I'm not saying, listen... We get tripped up on this, and I've been accused of preaching elitism along with, I'm sure you've been accused of that at times too, Brian. The scriptures are clear to me. You can be saved and know the forgiveness of the Lord, be washed of your sins, have a new heart and a new spirit, but not be filled to fullness with the Son. There's going to be great disappointment for many, many when we behold the Lord face to face and we're made aware of what could have been had we only cooperated with him. I'm not saying we'll be kicked out of heaven, though many who think they're saved are in for a rude awakening. I'm saying that for many, we have experienced forgiveness, but we have not come into this dynamic where we say, which is what the Lord intended, a born again life where we say, I'll take your life, Lord, you do away with mine, crucify it. In fact, let's be honest, we, I, 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 this, this dawned on me when I started writing the book. I was like, you know, I grew up in a time, and for many of us in this room we did, where the church was talking about, at least they were talking about the return of the Lord. They might not have been hitting this readiness message, but at least we were talking about the return of the Lord. We don't even talk about the return of the Lord anymore. The church doesn't want the Lord to come back. Why? Because we're in love with our lives. We love the things of this world. We love our quote-unquote freedom. We love the fact that we're in control. 
And we've learned to manipulate the scriptures in such a way to develop doctrines that justify our chosen uh, expression of loving our own lives. And what we've been called into is a relationship, and John nailed it, where he must increase, I must decrease. So, bad news, John, I'm only on, uh, I've only hit one of the little things I scribbled down. I got about 38 more to go, so I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Uh, part of us, it's interesting, I've, I've, been, I've spent a lot of time in, in 1 John. I, I love the writings of John. I was talking to Brian about this. John is an interesting writer, though, because I, I'm wired a little bit more like Paul. Paul is a legal, was a, he was a legal scholar. Um, he understood the law. And so, like any lawyer, Paul presents things kind of in a linear fashion. So, he starts at point A and you take, he takes you on this journey and he arrives at a conclusion. And you're like, wow, that makes sense. John doesn't do that. John kind of wanders around in circles. And so, I spent a lot of time reading 1 John and, I've, and, I, and I just needed some help. And I finally realized that in part that's a prophetic, uh, a little bit of a, a prophetic calling. But in part, I think John is just a fisherman who's not used to telling linear stories and making linear arguments. But, you know, John wrote his, not only the gospel, John wrote his epistles to refute two major heresies that were in the church in his day. And those heresies were Gnosticism and Docetism. And those sound like incredibly big words, and I like to use big words sometimes because it makes me sound smarter than I really am. I'm really not smart. Somebody told me, they're like, we really like your book because they were like, other books we've read, and they started naming names. They're like, sometimes it's just hard to understand, and yours are just, and I said, simple. And they, and they said, yeah. And I said, yeah, it's because I'm stupid. And so I have to put it in language that I understand. And they're like, well, whatever it is, it's great because I relate to it. But, um, Anyway, I, that's not a plug. That sounded horrible. Um, so, Docetism is this. Docetism was a belief that Jesus, that the incarnation didn't really happen. That Jesus just appeared as a vision to the disciples and to everybody else that saw him in his day. That it was either just a vision or that it was some type of heavenly apparition, but he did not come in a physical body. And we know that to be a heresy. Gnosticism, which kind of was an offshoot of this docetic uh, belief system, is a belief that anything that has to do with the flesh is evil. So anything in the natural world, anything relating to our bodies, it's all evil. And only that which is spiritual is good. And so, um, and you know, to some there's a little bit of truth in that because certainly that which is of the flesh, as we've come to know the flesh, is evil. But the, the Gnostics took it to a whole nother level that God didn't intend for it to go to. And they actually developed this weird belief system. And you tell me if this isn't in the church today. I, I'm convinced it is. I believe it's a Nicolaitan spirit. But they actually developed a belief system that suggested that you can live your life however you want to because you're just flesh. You can engage in any type of activity you want to, and it doesn't matter. All that really matters is your spiritual relationship with God. You tell me that's not in the church today. It is absolutely present in the church today. That's why I brought it up. But I also brought up deceitism because deceitism is also in the church today. And I want to hit on this for just a second because I think it's important. Now, there aren't people that I know of who refute the incarnation of Christ. But do we understand that what he did historically, he also intends to do again in his people? Do we understand that just as he became incarnate in the man Jesus of Nazareth, Christ, the eternal one, means to manifest himself in you and me? See, we don't... I'm not even sure we believe that in here. And I'm not trying to criticize you guys. I struggle with that. Right? And yet, that is the essence of our message, is it not, Ken? That the Lord has so given himself to us that he wants to inhabit us so that Christ is manifest through you and me. Now, I'm not at a place where... 
you know, I experience that to a little bit every now and then. I want to live in the flow of his life so that is an everyday reality. But I have to believe that that's what he intends to do or else I won't cooperate with him in the process and it'll, I'll never be prepared for his coming. Readiness has everything to do with laying hold of that belief and saying, Lord, if you said you're going to do it, it's possible and I'm going to give myself to the process. So we have to believe it. And by the way, believe, belief is not a function of the mind. Belief is a function of the heart. Your mind is going to come up with all kinds of arguments as to why that could never be a reality for you. You got to learn to stand and believe and contend for it. That is the essence of our warfare. In fact, all of the, our concept of spiritual warfare, I think we had it wrong for so many years. The enemy isn't just out to give us a bad day and to create havoc in our lives. He is intentional and focused with his warfare because he's terrified of Christ becoming manifest in his people. Anyway, the Lord told me as I was going down this path, so I just bring that up, by the way, just to challenge you because that, that needs to constantly be before us. The messaging we're getting from much of the church right now is completely opposed to the idea that Lord, the Lord wants to manifest himself fully in you and me. We need to constantly renew our minds and understand that what is it that we're being prepared for? It is for that. It is for Christ to become. Listen, I'm not talking about, we, we don't become God. I'm not suggesting that. We were talking about one of the heresies in the church is the little God's doctrine. And it is present where people actually believe that once you get saved, there's so much of the Lord in you that he's transformed you and now you are a little God. And that's nonsense. That's a heresy. It's an absolute heresy. But what I am saying is that he wants to deal with you and me to such a degree that it's no longer our lives being expressed. It is the life of another and it is the essence and the nature of Christ himself. Not perfection. We'll never be perfect. Not in the way we've come to understand perfection. But I'm just talking about at a nature level what's being expressed is not of Adam. It is of Christ. That's the intent. And we have to be focused in that. So the Lord told me actually as I went through this parable that the watchtower was a key to understanding. And so I want to kind of switch gears just a little bit and get into that. Um, you know, we don't have, and, and, and when he told me that, I'm like, Lord, I don't even understand the purpose of a watchtower in a vineyard. Like, I mean, that just doesn't register for me. I grew up in a farming family, and so I'm a little bit familiar with agriculture, at least a modern day you know, form of agriculture. And I thought we, we had nothing like that on the farm. Like we, we weren't worried about people coming in and stealing our crops or anything like that. So I helped me understand this. And so the Lord, he told me to do a little research. So I, I, I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not good at research, but I, I can work the Google machine. So I, I got on Google and I searched, what is the purpose of a watchtower in a vineyard? And I found that in ancient Israel, Back during the, the day, that, that day, they actually had two primary um, enemies of the vine, right? They had foxes, and by foxes, the word in the Greek is actually like kind of a catch-all for small animals that would come and they would eat the tender shoots of a grapevine, which would absolutely impact negatively the harvest, so that was enemy number one. Enemy number two were thieves because wine was a commodity back in the day. In fact, wine was more prevalent in ancient Israel than was good water because much of the water that they had was tainted. And so it was having a good well that brought forth good, clean water was actually a little bit of a rare thing. So wine was highly sought after, and by virtue of the fact that you make wine from grapes, grapes were highly sought after. So the two primary enemies of the vine were thieves and foxes. And traditionally, I would say that you and I have a pretty good understanding as to who the thief is and who, what the foxes refer to. I think of two scriptures when I think of that, Michael. I think, first of all, with foxes, I think of Song of Solomon 8.2, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine, right? And we've traditionally understood that to be 
um, either the cares of the world that would sort of divert our attention away from the Lord and our devotion away from the Lord, or maybe those little what we call pet sins that, it, you know, in, the, in our sliding scale of assessing the seriousness of sin, maybe we think, well, they're not really that serious. I mean, it's not like murder or adultery. It's just like little white lies every now and then. That's how we've traditionally understood the little foxes, right? Either little sins or the cares of the world. And there may be an element of truth in that. I'm not, I'm not denying that. We've also, the scripture that I associate with the thieves is John 10.10. 10. The thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. And we always, always, always associate that with who? who do, who's the thief? Satan, right? This is interactive. You guys can, you guys can speak. I, I felt bad this morning, by the way, that uh, that uh, Brian has had a push for uh, being here on time, and he told me that this morning, and I was the last one through the doors. No, I'm, so I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm messing with you. I'm really not sorry. I just, I just, I did it on purpose. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so, so that's my traditional understanding, and there's a measure of truth in that. We do need to be concerned that we have a thief who wants to steal, kill, and destroy in Satan. And he is directly opposed to the harvest. And we do have to contend with the cares of the world and those little pet sins. And they will destroy the harvest. They will. They will negatively impact it. But that's not the scriptural, I believe, the true interpretation of both of those entities I want to look at John. I don't think that's what the Lord is hitting on. He's certainly, that's not what he's hitting on this morning. So I want to look at John 10. But before I do, I want to look at John 9. Because John 9 and John, between John 9 and, and John 10 is one of the worst places. You know, when the people who, the, the original scripture wasn't written in chapter and verse, right? It was just written. It was just a one big narrative or a letter. And uh, the people that divvied up the scriptures did us no favors when they put a break between John 9 and John 10. Because John 10 is, the, and what Jesus says in John 10 is in the context of what happened in John 9. So I want to just hit on this just for a second. John, we're going to read through the whole chapter of John 9, so I'll try to read fast, okay? How many bananas do you have back there? You got plenty? Oh, okay. Cool. Well, if I get hungry, I'll have you come up. All right. As he passed by, he saw a man blind, uh, blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is, not, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. In other words, that's not really the man. He just looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. 
His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, they're speaking of Jesus by the way, He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has... By the way, what a curse to speak on yourself. You are Christ's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, and those who do not, that those who do not see may see and those who may see become blind. Th those who see, I'm sorry, those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. And it is in this context that Jesus goes on and says this in chapter 10, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man, pay attention to that word man, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone here enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So who is Jesus referring to? He's not talking about Satan. Now I have no interest in being a legal defense for Satan because clearly Satan is behind the thieves and robbers who have brought their accusation against God's anointed one. But Jesus is clearly pointing to men, leaders, the blind leading the blind, the false leaders of Israel. We have to see this. This language, and by the way, the Lord is consistent with His language. I found this to be true when I sat down to write. The Lord is consistent with the imagery that He chooses and uses in the Scripture. This is not the first time that thieves or robbers have been used to be associated with false leadership. Jeremiah, I'm not going to read the entirety of this Scripture. Well, actually this one I will. Jeremiah 7.11 this is the very scripture that Jesus used when he went into the temple with a whip of cords to drive out the money changers. Has this house, which is called by name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. So what we have here is an indictment against false leadership 
in the house of God. Again, I'm, on, I'm not on a witch hunt. I'm not into, you know, we experienced this. I remember in the 90s, I, the, 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 there was, I think there was a local guy that had a radio show. That's about all I'm going to say. And his whole ministry was to point out false leaders in the house of God. All I'm going to say about that is if the Lord has called you to do that, you better know that you know it's the Lord. And you better be careful about not coming under the spirit of the accuser. Because that is a very real threat, I think, in the body of Christ. That said, um, I, I'm, I'm not one who is for pointing and naming names or even I have to be really careful about pointing out certain um, teachings, although I think it's called for in the body of Christ because it is rampant and it's causing confusion in the house of God. And if I learn anything from Matthew 21, it's this. False leadership will absolutely destroy the harvest. You guys, we have to see this. If the thief is allowed into the house of God, then God won't get what he desires to get in our generation. If we give our ear to the thieves, it will prohibit the life of Christ from coming forth in fullness. You need to see this. So what are the foxes? I believe, again, the Lord is speaking through the foxes. I'm going to read one scripture, and I'm going to read it really fast. And this is from Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 13. It says, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy, and those who prophesy out of their own heart hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets! who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the deserts. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord. They have envisioned futility and false divination, saying, Thus says the Lord, but the Lord has not sent them. Yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. Have you not seen a futile vision, and have you not spoken false divination? You say the Lord says, but I have not spoken. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, therefore I am indeed against you, says the Lord God. And he goes on from there. But here's the point I'm trying to make. The foxes and the thieves that the Lord is pointing to that will destroy the harvest is the false leadership in the house of God. Now, I told Donna last night, she asked what I was going to share, and I told her, and I saw the look of horror on her face. I am not calling Brian or Ken out as false leaders. I believe the opposite about them. I believe they're called of the Lord. Do we have false leadership in the greater body of Christ? We absolutely do. And again, I said it earlier, do we have those who I believe are just profiting and have no desire, no relationship whatsoever with the Lord? I believe we do. Do I know who those people are? No, that's not my business. That's not my place. I'm not here to try to determine who's, who's a good leader and who's not. And I'm not trying to, here to try to determine who has a good heart and who doesn't. But I believe we have absolute wolves dressed up as sheep in leadership positions in the house of God. In some of the most prominent ministries, I think, in the world. Do we also have those who are called of the Lord and whose hearts are right, but they just don't have the revelation and they're not seeking the Lord? Yes, I believe we do. I believe we have those who were called of the Lord and somewhere they lost their way. Can those people be restored? I don't know. That's not for me to say, but they shouldn't be listened to. We need to be really careful and discerning about who we're listening to. And we have a litmus test in this. Y'all know what a litmus test is, right? That's the old... When you're in school, you determine what was an acid and what's a base, and you drop the little thing in, and depending on the color, you could determine. We have a litmus test that absolutely the standard is, who are you pointing to? What life are you testifying of? I don't mean whose name are you using, because even the false will use the name of Jesus, or else no one would listen to them. But are you pointing to man, or are you pointing to the Son of Man? Because if you're exalting the Son of Man, and not just in a form, but if you're pointing to Christ in His people, in His intention to be your life, 
then you have the right message and you're listening to the right person. But if you're pointing to anything else, if you're pointing to people who are puffing up religious forms, if you're listening to people who are pointing, up to, their, pointing to their own giftedness or to their own ministries or to pointing to dead works, you're listening to the wrong source. And you guys, in this hour, there's so much deception. Brian and I were talking about this yesterday. We used to say, man, when the great delusion comes, we're going to see a lot of people swept away. I no longer say that. We're in the great delusion. There has been a great falling away. Maybe not in the way that we thought. Maybe we thought people were going to be into such blatant godlessness and blatant sin that they, they don't even want to have anything to do with the name of Jesus or anything associated with the name of Jesus. But I'm telling you that you can be totally religious and be completely swept into great delusion. And we're seeing it, you guys. We need to be careful about who we're listening to. But I'm wanting to just spend a few minutes. I don't know how we're doing on time. But I want to take this down to the individual level real quick. That was my intent in bringing this up. It's not just to point. You know, we could end here and go, oh, we heard a message on beware of false teachers in the church out there somewhere and don't listen to them. But that's not at all what I'm hitting at. And I don't believe that's at all what the Lord would do in you guys this morning and in all of us this morning. I think the Lord wants to bring it right down to the governmental level of this temple. Right? So there's a corporate expression of the bride. There's also an individual expression. Right? So I'm meant to be bridal in my relationship with the Lord. I'm meant to become, at an individual level, a temple of His Spirit. I'm meant as an individual to come into this mature sonship whereby I allow the life of the obedient son to be expressed in me and through me. There's also a corporate, but the corporate is made up of individuals. So we could talk about the corporate government within the church that needs to take place. We need to have the life of Christ in the corporate body exalting Christ, pointing to Christ in all things, pointing to his eternal plan and purpose to fill us with the full measure of the Son. But we also need to talk about what is governing me at an individual level. And am I coming as an individual fully under his government? Am I learning to cooperate with him? Am I learning to depend upon him? Because you guys, if there's anything of the thief or the fox at work in me, it will absolutely prohibit and possibly destroy the harvest if it's not dealt with. We need to hear this. Do I need to say that again? If there's anything of the thief at work in me, or if there's anything of the fox nature at work in me, it will prohibit his life from coming forth in me as the harvest that the Father is looking for. What do I mean by that? You guys, we've heard a lot of teaching about being made ready for the Lord. I know you guys have. I, I know the way it's been presented in this place. I'm not, I'm not questioning that in the least. But I also know our tendency to hear something and twist a message ever so slightly and think, oh man, now I got to get busy. I got to become bridal. I need to get ready for the Lord. I need to do more. I, I need to... I need to pray more. I need to, I need to seek the Lord more. I need, maybe I need to fast more. I, I, need to, I need to try to clean some things up. You guys, if we get religious about this, if we think that somehow we can make ourselves ready, we're no different than the blind guides of Israel. You know what I love about the story we just read? Is that this man who was born blind and had no illusions about who he was or who he was before he met Jesus and even who he was after Jesus gave him sight. He was well aware of his broken condition. It was Israel who thought they could see and yet were blind who were deluded. They thought they had something to bring to the table in their relationship with God. What a lie. You guys, we have nothing to bring to this. This is a totally one-sided relationship. And I can't do anything, and unless you think I'm about to get you off the hook in terms of personal responsibility, I'm not. Because we do bear personal responsibility for our choices. 
But you guys, I can't make myself ready for the Lord. I can't make myself bridle to the Lord. I can't make myself become the obedient son that he's looking for. I can't make the life of Christ come forth in me. And we probably are aware of this in our heads, but there are subtle ways in which we try to help the Lord out and we get religious and what we end up doing is having a form of godliness with no real power to transform because the source is not the Lord, it's us. Life doesn't come from our prayer times with the Lord. I'm not, am I saying don't, don't pray? No. I'm saying life isn't in the prayer. Life comes from the person. Life doesn't come from just reading the Bible more. Am I saying don't read the, the Bible? No. I'm saying get in the Word. But life comes through the person. Life doesn't come. Here's what I'm saying. Life doesn't come through doing. Life comes from the person. Jesus put it this way. John 15, he says, abide in me and I will abide in you. And he said, he who abides in me will bear much fruit. Our responsibility is to strive to be in Christ relationally 24-7. It's to get into Him, to commune with Him. And we tend to, as fallen humans, and this, is, this was demonstrated in Adam immediately after the fall, who as soon as he recognized the problem of his own sin, immediately went out and tried to fix the problem by sewing fig leaves together to cover his own nakedness. You guys, no one can cover your nakedness except for the life. It's in the sun. Your works won't do it. And your works won't cause him to come forth in greater measure. And I'm, I believe the warning of the Lord is to think that we can somehow be made ready to him and circumvent the process of being in intimate fellowship with him. He's got us on a journey whereby we learn to engage in a relationship with him on an ongoing basis. And I mentioned this to you guys earlier. The Lord told me in this, in this parable that the, that the watchtower was a key. And here's what the Lord spoke to me on the watchtower. And I will close with this. I asked the Lord, I said, again, you keep talking about this watchtower. I said, what is the significance? I'm just not getting it. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, what is it that you do in a watchtower? I thought, well, you, you watch, <laughs> you know, like you're watching. And he said, yeah. And he said, don't make the mistake of thinking that all your time is meant to be focused on the enemy. It's not. If you're only focusing, focusing on the enemy, if you're only watching for the enemy, you're missing the purpose. I've set you to be a watchman of mine so that your eyes are constantly on me. Can you guys see that's not a doing, that is a posture of our hearts whereby we recognize the Lord is giving him. Do you guys know that he, we talked about grace earlier being an extension of God's life to us. He gives himself to us. That is not an event. I woke up this morning and I was, I was actually in the bathroom and I was praying about this morning and I'm like, Lord, please like, let's let the word of the Lord come forth. And the Lord stopped me and he said, he said, you're so event focused. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you're getting prayed up because you want the testimony of the Lord to come forth in your preaching. And he said, I'm not as worried about your preaching. He said, I'd rather get a hold of your heart. That way you don't have to pray up for these events. If I get your heart, then my life will flow through you constantly. Do you know that the Lord is not interested in just giving himself to us so that we can accomplish something? He's given himself to us relationally. And what he's saying in the watchtower is if you would learn to be a watchman of mine, then you would be constantly have your eyes. And I get it, you guys. We, we live in a, a, a temporal world. We have temporal responsibilities, physical things that we have to do. Our souls come into play. And it's not like we're just sitting in a room all day going, Jesus, 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 I need to see you. But there is a reality whereby we can learn and we're meant to learn. And this is the very preparatory process the Lord has us where we learn to engage with him spirit to spirit and watch him throughout our day and become fixated on Jesus. He becomes our focus. It's not a doing, y'all. It's not. 
It doesn't mean there aren't good works that he has for us. It doesn't mean there aren't times where he wants us to block everything out and sit in our prayer closet and just commune with him. I believe in that. I, I love those times that I have with the Lord. But he's after something far deeper than just an event called prayer. Are you hearing my heart in all this? I'm not in any way bashing, you know, the, any of the activities that we associate with relationship, but it's the relationship he's after, not the activities. And we've majored in the minors and we've elevated the activities at the forsaking of the relationship in the church so that we make prayer a form of godliness with no real power in it. So that we make Bible study a form of godliness with no real power in it. So that we make ministry, whatever, you name it. We take the things of God and we divorce them from God himself relationally, thinking that we can walk in them and use them as a means to an end. And it, and it will not happen. It cannot be. And it will not produce what the Lord is after. The other thing that the Lord told me, and this is so important, what he told me about a watchtower. He said, what else do you do in a watchtower? And I thought... It's a watchtower, Lord. I, you're going to have to clue me in to the rest of it. I'm the watching part I get. What else? And then I thought about it, and instantly the thought came to me, and I thought of those, those tenant farmers sitting in a watchtower and all of the time they spent waiting. Pretty boring job, I would think. It's not like thieves and foxes are pouring into the vineyard constantly. I used to deer hunt when I was younger. And... Uh, Deer hunting is great if you love just spending gobs of time in the woods by yourself. That's why I like it. But it was a treat for me when I saw a deer and a, and a big treat when I saw a deer that I felt like shooting. I was out there because I just loved the time being alone in the quiet, just kind of in a place of stillness. And the Lord says, bingo, watching and waiting and I thought, that's an interesting word, waiting. What does that mean? It means way more than just waiting. I actually looked the word up in the dictionary, and I was kind of appalled at the, at the dictionary meaning. The, the, the Webster's Dictionary actually said, doing, uh, it said spending uh, large amounts of time doing very little, waiting for something very specific to happen. And I thought, that doesn't really make things clear to me. But I guess it fits, but if you look at the Hebrew concept of waiting, it actually means something far more rich, far richer. I don't know. My mom is an English, my grandmother was an English teacher. She would know which word to use. But um, the Hebrew concept of waiting has to do with the passage of time in a place of stillness while you become bound to the will of another. So the scripture in Isaiah, that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's not just passively waiting for something to happen. That's not just, well, I prayed for something to happen, Lord. Now I just am going to wait for you to do it. No, no. It's in the withholding of the answer to the prayer, the Lord would bind us to his will for our lives. Can you see that that's a far deeper work that the Lord would do in us? And so the Lord told me, he said, if you can learn to watch and wait upon me and cultivate a lifestyle, a relationship with me where watching and waiting become the priority, where your eyes are fixed on me and you allow me to bind you to my will. Well, what is his will? Is it not expressed in eternal plan and purpose? Then he says, you become a yielded vessel through which I can first give myself to and I can deal with the internal government of your own heart, bring you under my government, deal with your flesh, put the old man to death, cause you to decrease through the work of the cross and the life of my son to increase. But I'll also make you a testimony to others. Isn't that a beautiful picture? But it comes through yielding and yieldedness. It's funny. I have to tell this story on my 16-year-old daughter. She is learning to drive. Or she's, she's driving now. When I was writing the book, she was 15 and learning to drive. And uh, we had one of those father-son or father-daughter moments where we're driving along and we come to a yield sign. And I said, okay, Abigail, I said, pop quiz time. What does a yield sign mean? 
And her response was very interesting and probably, um, probably along the lines of what most of us think about what a yield sign means. She says, well, you know, at a stop sign, you have to stop. And at a yield sign, you just have to slow down a little bit. Then you can go. And I said, that's not at all what a yield sign means. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We need to make sure we get this one before you drive on your own. I said, a yield sign means look for oncoming traffic. And I said, if there's any oncoming traffic, you don't have the right of way. You need to yield to them and let them come. And, I, and it, as soon as I said that, the Lord said, that's exactly what yieldingness looks like to me. You know, the scripture, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Problem is in the church, I think most of us go off sort of half cocked with an idea of what the Lord wants. And we think, I can do this, Lord. I can do this for you. You want a ministry? I'll walk in ministry. You want me to pray? I'll spend time in prayer. You want me to, you want me to get in the Word? I'll get in the Word and I'll study and, and show myself approved a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And the Lord's going, I want you to yield to me. I want you to have a relationship where you learn to watch me and only do what I'm doing. Remember, that's what Jesus said. The son can do nothing on his own, but only that which he sees the father doing. He's the firstborn among many brothers. What makes us think that we don't have to have the same kind of relationship with him, learning to yield to the father as the son did? If we can learn to yield to him... If we can learn to cultivate that lifestyle, you guys, what could the Lord do to bring about the increase of his son? Listen, he's fully capable of causing. This whole thing of docetism and us not believing in the incarnation, it's nothing to him to cause the life of his son to be manifest in you and me. It would be so easy for him, the snap of his fingers, he could cause the fullness of his son to come forth in you and me. The problem is not can God do it or does he want to do it. The problem is, is we're standing in the way. We read one more scripture. I promise this is going to be it. I'm going to close with this. This is uh, Ezekiel 43. Wait a minute. Ha <laughs> ha. Is it Ezekiel 43 or Ezekiel 44? You guys don't know. Yeah, here it is, Ezekiel 43, starting with verse 6. While the man was standing beside me, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. And the house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings by their whoring and by the dead bodies of their kings at their high places. Can you stop there and say, that's a pretty serious offense. Their adultery, their whoring. How did they commit adultery and whoring? Verse 8, by setting their threshold by my threshold, and their doorposts beside my doorposts, with only a wall between me and them. They have defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed, so I have consumed them in my anger. Why am I bringing the scripture up? It's kind of an obscure little passage of scripture. What was the great offense of Israel? They were building doorposts that only the Lord could build. And they were laying thresholds that only the Lord could lay. And in the process, they had constructed a wall between them and the Lord. Now let's take this down to the individual, and this is where I'm going to stop, I promise. When we rely on our own efforts, when we rely on our own strength, when we rely on our own wisdom, when we rely on our own forms of godliness without yielding to the Lord, it is of the offense of Israel where we're attempting to build in the house of God what only he can build. And in our efforts to help the Lord out, we are constructing a wall between him and us. You guys, we have to see this in the context of readiness. If you would be to the Lord a bridal people, it is not going to come through your own efforts. 
Am I saying you don't bear responsibility in this? No, you bear the responsibility of getting before the Lord and being still and waiting upon Him and yielding to Him and walking in obedience to what He's calling you to do. I'm simply saying that only the Lord can do what He alone is meant to do. You can't do it, and you can't help Him out in the process. You will only get in His way. I want to, I want to just end with this, and I want to, I want to pray into this a little bit. I, I really felt this morning, Heather and I were, had been hit with just major waves of fatigue and exhaustion in the last couple of days like unusually so. You were even talking about being really tired lately. And I just dismissed it at first. And, and then this morning, I, I felt like there's something in this. Do you guys know that, that we, we burn ourselves out sometimes in the church, number one, by trying to do things that the Lord has never called us to do and by living out of... Here's what we're talking about in this message. We're talking about living out of Adam instead of living out of Christ. And living out of Adam is a very tiring, exhausting source. Can anybody identify with this? You're trying to please the Lord. You're trying to maintain this relationship. You're trying to do all the things that you know to do. You're trying to be bridal because the emphasis at church is on being bridal. And you're trying to get it right. And you're trying to be clothed in readiness. But I don't know how to do it. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And we're wearing ourselves out and we get exhausted. And I think for many of us, actually even our bodies start to break down a little bit. I think that's why some of us are even experience sickness. I'm not making a religious formula out of this and that saying that's the source of all sickness. I'm just saying it can lead over into our physical bodies. And the Lord is saying enough. You're wearing yourself out and you're missing the point of all this. All you can do is take me by the hand, become yielded to me in a conduit of my spirit and allow me to build my house in you because that's exactly what he's doing. It's what he wants to do. And we keep getting in his way. I believe the Lord wants to give rest this morning. I believe it may even be physical healing for some of you guys, and I want to pray into that. I also believe that we have become so, um, I think for some of us, and I know this is not a function of being in this church, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying at all. We've come into this understanding with a lot of religious baggage and with a lot of bad teaching, quite frankly wrong understanding of what the Lord is after, wrong understanding of what is our responsibility in this relationship. And we brought our religious baggage into the mix, and I believe the Lord wants to flush all that stuff out. I believe he wants to give a, a, it's a, uh, there's a, I think there's a, the Lord would pour himself out as a refreshing to you deep within in a place of rest that's a Hebrews 4.1 rest to you. You don't know that scripture, right? While this, I'm going to butcher it, but while this rest remains, let us fear lest any of you should have failed to enter into it. If there's going to be any striving, if there's going to be anything, I, I was driving with, um, with Terry Bennett several months back, and he and I were just talking, and we were riding along the road, and he pointed to the trees, and he said, you want to, you want to know what life looks like? And that this was beautiful. Because we, we get so religious with it, don't we? We try to program it and we try to manufacture it. He said, you don't want to know what life looks like. He pointed to the trees and he said, look at the trees. He said, you know, it's just inherent in them that they reach for the life. The, the light, sorry, they reach for the light. They do whatever's necessary to get their leaves into the light because they understand that the light is the source of life. And I thought, man, that's it. I said, if there's going to be any striving into me, it's let me strive to enter that rest. Let me strive to come into the light. Let me strive to know him. Let me strive to be a person who learns to wait upon the Lord, watching him with eyes wide open throughout my day. You guys, I mentioned at the outset, Lord, I can do this the hard way or I can do this the easy way. The hard way will get me nowhere and it won't benefit anybody. We can try to be clothed in readiness and to be bridal to the Lord the hard way or the easy way. And the hard way, I promise you, is only going to wear us out. So here's what I believe. I want to pray this. I believe the Lord wants there to be a governmental increase of his life 
He's more than willing to do it. It's just, are we willing to let go of whatever it is the Lord is putting his finger on this morning and saying, hey, you need to lay this down, Adam. You need to stop living out of the wrong source and learn to trust me and let me be God in you and let me build what needs to be built in you. So, Lord, I just ask for that. I, I, would you cultivate a lifestyle of being watchers and those who wait upon the Lord, recognizing, Lord, that all that we're desiring, all that we're seeking, all that we're throwing ourselves into, all that we will be held accountable for when we stand before you, is in the life of the Son and in no other place. It's not in Adam. It's not in our, our ability to understand. It's not in our ability to do. It's not in our ability to manufacture. We can't make ourselves ready, Lord. We can't manufacture holiness. We can't fake the life of Christ. We might fool some people some of the time. We might even fool ourselves much of the time. But we won't fool you. You are eager to build your house, Lord, and you're doing it in our day. And I believe, I'm convinced we are at the end of the end. I'm convinced we live in a day, Lord, where you're going to have the corporate expression of sonship that you've desired and that you pointed to in the scriptures. I believe we live in a day where the latter rain is going to outshine the former. And I say, Lord, hasten that day. May it be. Give us faith to believe that it's on your heart to do. But may we also be quickened to a place of faith and understanding that only you can do it. And I can't add anything to the equation. All I can do is cooperate with you. And a good part of my cooperation is stop trying to do it on my own. I ask for the rest that you would gather us into by your spirit Make it a reality in us as your people. I ask where there's fatigue this morning, weariness this morning. I pray, Lord, that you bring an end to it by bringing us into a deeper place of inner rest, relying totally in the sufficiency of the life of the Son. We renounce even the thought that Adam can produce anything acceptable to you, Lord. Our fallenness, our old man, that old nature, that old life, the flesh life, the self life, Lord, is totally incapable of producing anything of any value. Forgive us for putting our dependency in it, trusting in our own understanding, trusting in our own strength. Teach us, Lord, to embrace Christ within I ask even, Lord, where there's been a place of, of that weariness impacting our physical bodies, Lord. I, even, I, I just believe, Lord, that there's healing that you would release in this place, Lord. But you would first deal with the source of it. We're weary from, from trying to manufacture things, from putting our doorposts next to your doorposts, our threshold next to your threshold. And we've been cut off, essentially, through our own inability to get out of your way. We've been cut off and built a wall between you and us. Forgive us for that, Lord. Tear down the wall. Teach us, Lord, how to be a people that just come before you and learn to eat of your presence inwardly, Lord. We're not doing a bunch of stuff outwardly to satisfy a God who's up in heaven somewhere. We would be a people who learn to come and commune with Christ in the inner man. You are off in heaven, but you are also just as present within us if we've been born again. Let us learn to commune with you in the secret place. We would hasten the day of your return, Lord. And we recognize that the coming of the Lord means the end of everything else. It means the end of our lives, Lord. And all that we love about this temporal world, it's going to burn up, Lord. 
Well, I thank you, Lord, that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, Lord, and we're going to get to enjoy that. But in the midst of all this, Lord, you're speaking to us that to truly hasten the day is to embrace the fact, Lord, that our lives will be consumed fully by you. May we understand that that also means the day of our governing ourself must come to an end. The day of our relying upon our own strength and our own understanding must come to an end. We say yes, Lord. We lay it down. Our own tendencies to establish forms of godliness where Adam is source, but there's no life in it. We lay it down. Life isn't in our religious activity. Life is in the person. Lord, we recognize, Lord, if we're to enter into the depths of intimacy that you've created us for, Adam must be fully dethroned in the inner man. We ask that you would not let up in this process until he's dealt with. You're worth the disruption, Lord. You're worth the process. I believe even in this hour you would come into your house and turn over tables to drive Adam out. May we not resist you in that. And I pray, Lord, for discernment. As you come in to do that, as you come in to drive Adam out, Lord, to deal with the flesh through the cross, May we not resort back to a religious understanding or religious doctrines that would somehow insulate ourselves from your very process designed to subjugate our souls. But may we cooperate with you in it and see the hand of God in the disruption, in the hardship, if and when necessary, in the discipline Thank you, Lord, that you're not a God that just inflicts needless pain and suffering on your people. It is all unto the fullness of what you have intended. And, Lord, we would not stand in your way in that. Again, I just say what a joy, Lord, for a people who understand to the nth degree, we are not worthy to bow down before your feet and untie your sandals. Yet you would call us into such an intimate knowing of you in the inner man that you would literally have us sit on your throne with you. What an amazing, kind, generous, loving God. Only you could do this, Lord. Only you could do it. We say yes to you. Have the full measure of what you're after. May we enter fully into that rest where we just trust you. We trust you. Lord, I, I'm convinced I don't, I don't even have the capacity to trust you. I can't. Even, if, even by me thinking that I can somehow conjure up enough faith, conjure up enough trust in you, that is a lie of Adam who was the original thief who took your place <laughs> in the governance of his own life. Lord, even the ability to trust you comes by the Spirit. We've been invited into an eternal relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a relationship that has existed for eternity. 
And that is a relationship of explicit trust in one another. The Father loves the Son in all things and trusts the Son, and the Son trusts the Father to the nth degree and demonstrated it at the cross. And Lord, we've been invited into that reality whereby you would bring forth a trust of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in me and in us. We say do it, Lord. Do it. That we might truly let go and yield to you in the way that you've called us to yield to you. You would pour out yourself as a refreshing river of water. In fact, you said it this way that you would cause springs of living water to spring up from us. That is not a thing. That's your life coming forth to be refreshment to us in the truest sense. I ask that you would do that in a deeper way in us this morning. Break off the heaviness, Lord. Break off the weariness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Ben. That was an awesome, awesome message. Yeah. Um, just real quick here, um, just want to, again, encourage you to get Ben's book, Clothes and Readiness. I believe, don't you have a chapter that goes into basically this message you just preached, basically? Kind of? Yeah, I didn't want to say that I was preaching the whole word. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. But, but I think it's really helpful because Ben said a lot to, to get this book and, uh, and read it and get it in your heart because sometimes when you're speaking, it's hard to, when you're hearing someone speak, it's hard to get that fully in your own heart. So I want to encourage you to get that book. It'll be in the back. You can also get it online, clothedandreadiness.com. Uh, so I just want to encourage you to get that. I, um, just, I know, just real quick, it was, in, it was very, inter <clears throat> very interesting to me when we waited on the Lord uh, as we entered this year is the Lord gave us a scripture verse. I'm, I'm going to read it. I know probably everyone's like, not another scripture verse. But just really, I do want to just make a note of this. Just it's very interesting. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, this is the Lord, the word the Lord gave us, Revelation 3, uh, verse 2, or uh, actually verse 3, is that the Lord says, therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. Uh, and it's interesting that the Lord is emphasizing to us thief. So I, I preached about that at the beginning of the year. And then for the Lord to direct Ben to preach about the thieves coming, I really think the Lord is emphasizing that to us. I want to pray just real quick that the Lord would give us full understanding. I know we've gotten some measure of understanding, but I don't think that's a coincidence that at the last minute Ben changed up his message and it was about the theme of a, a thief. And so the Lord's coming like a thief in the night, and the Lord, you know, there's also false leadership, which I'm not one of them. Thanks, Ben, for pointing that out, because honestly, some people in the past that no longer go, go here, they were kindly asked to leave, thought when <laughs> Terry Bennett was talking about false leadership, he was talking about me. So we, we were like, yeah, I don't think that's what he was talking about. But, uh, but I do want to pray just real quick that the Lord would give us real clarity on that. Uh, so, Lord, I do pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for uh, Ben's really awesome message. And I'm asking you, Father, to, uh, to really give us clarity of what you are speaking about you coming as a thief in the night. I know you gave us that verse at the beginning of the year. And then Ben emphasizes it and brings it into the context of, of leadership that's stealing, killing, and destroying from your house. Lord, I believe, I believe what you're speaking in this. I believe what you're speaking in this 
is just like you were coming as a thief in the night. You were coming as a thief to the church of Sardis because they were asleep. Is that you're coming to the American church in in this year? You're coming to the American church in, uh, in in the Western church, really the church around the world. You're coming to the church in judgment to remove. I'm not saying you're removing every single thief, false leader, but there is coming judgment in the house of God to false leadership that is leading your church astray. And Lord, we don't rejoice in any measure over your your judgment, but we do agree with it that it's righteous and it's true. And so, Lord, we say, Lord, uh, have your will, have your way, do what you want to do so that Lord, that your people, I guess my burden is, Lord, your people would not be deceived by false leadership, by the thieves that are stealing, killing, and destroying your people uh, when you've come to offer them your life and your life in abundance. So, Lord, we pray, God, that, that Lord, you, we just say yes, we agree with the need for judgment in the house of God on false leadership. And if there's anything in us, Lord, that needs to be corrected, that you would correct us in any belief, in anything we're believing, any influence, Lord, even where, Lord, any any teacher or podcaster or anything we're listening to that is not, that is a false teacher that is affecting us, Lord, I pray that you would reveal that to us, that we would not be led astray. In the name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. So just two quick announcements. Um, Remember, we have House of Prayer this Wednesday and this Thursday at 6 p.m., so I want to encourage you to come. And then we also have home groups, or house church, sorry, house church on Sunday. So if you don't have a house church you belong to, just let me know, and we'll get you to the right house church. So anyway, just those two announcements. Final announcement is we have the tithe and offering basket in the back. Remember your tithes and offerings. Other than that, have an awesome week, and we will see you in house church next Sunday and then house of prayer this week. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Ben. That was an awesome message, and uh, we'll see you next week or Wednesday. Amen.